I'm Angie, yeah, I'm the creative director of Trigger and joint CEO with Natalie who's over there. Um, and I'm here to talk a bit about Trigger and how we work and the task that we set ourselves, which is about being hyper-local and global at the same time, which seems a bit impossible. Um, and uh, yeah, a bit of a, a complex new set of themes. But anyway, so I want to tell you a bit about pollinations first of all, which is a really good example of how we make projects. So we're all about making um, usually outdoor, usually free, very accessible projects that look at creating social change. And Pollinations was a project that really was born from two concerns. So we had Colston statue coming down here and being thrown in the river at the same time as lockdown and us at home gardening. And I definitely became a very keen gardener during that time. Um, and so combining those two ideals, I started to think about how can we get people to think, to understand why we're a multicultural nation. And we found out with um, some research and development within ecologists that about 80% of the plants in our normal British gardens are non-native. And so when you open your curtains and you look at your back garden, if you're lucky enough to have one, most of what you see is multicultural. Even the hon honker tree has come from Turkey. The English rose is from China. And we wanted to open and lift the lid on that um, in the most accessible way we could. So I'm going to show you a little video of the work that we created. Um, it's important to tell you that when we went into Birmingham, into the space you're about to see, it was absolute grey, flat concrete, not a tree in miles. So everything you see we brought in, we um, worked with thousands of people around the city to go co-grow and co-plant and transform an urban space into a horticultural one. And then you'll see that we brought in artistic elements from costume, light shows, um, sound design, theatre shows, tea, all of those aspects. And we brought in 205 free arts artists to, bring, to, to, to use all of their art forms to bring everybody together to understand and, and feel pride about the fact that we're multicultural and that is what brings the beauty and diversity to our, our, our British world. Um, so, I'm gonna, uh, oops, this is pollinations. So as I said, this is <coughs> grey concrete and we worked with Chelsea award winning flower show designers to create this incredible horticultural sort of takeover and um, a lot of the plants were brought in and grown um, from people's homes and uh, about 4,000 were given away at the end and have gone, and all of them have gone on to have a future life, including the trees. What is home? Whose home is this? Where have we all come from? This 
whole education program plus the live event program has really meant that everyone has been part of this project. We've considered sustainability right from the off. So we've had ideas about where the horticulture comes from, how we responsibly give it away. So behind me we've got a thousand people who are taking away a thousand plants to live on into the future. <coughs> what materials are we using, where they've come from, and more importantly what their future life is. It's not come without its challenges, but it's been right at the heart of our consideration from the very, very beginning. Not only is it meant that we've created something that's never been done before, but also that it appeals to so many people. The future of pollinations is really exciting. It's been incredible to premiere here. And what better story to tell than to say, we created this here with local people. And we're really excited about heading off to other parts of the UK and internationally. in the past and how it's affected our um, British life today. But what I want to work on next is thinking about how colonisation is very much part of our lives today and how we're very much complicit in that. Um, so I want this here and there experiment, um, exploration to look at biopiracy. Biopiracy is the unethical patenting of plants and botanical or biological genome and what usually happens is that developed countries take uh, plants or species and they patent them basically on, on a big database system. The first person to patent that then owns it. And I'm going to tell you a bit about how that affects um, how we live today and a couple of examples. So this is a historic example. Um, and this is one we looked at in pollinations. Uh, this is Robert Fortune. Robert Fortune was a botanist based in Edinburgh. And he was sent out on a voyage. Some people call him an explorer and a hero. I call him a thief. He <laughs> went to uh, China. He dressed as a Chinese person. He learned Mandarin. He spoke Mandarin fluently enough to um, blend in. And his job was to steal the secret of tea. So until that point, tea was only made in China. It was only grown in China. It was only processed in China. And nobody knew how to do it. And you would have heard about the Boston Tea Party and um, the opium trade everything that led up to, to Fortune's void at that point. Now we in, went to Melbourne a couple of weeks ago and we literally gasped out loud when the herbarium uh, lady brought out a fusty um, bit of cardboard and opened it up and that is uh, Robert Fortune's leaf that he picked. Um, and that kind of changed the world. That, that, that movement, to pick that plant and bring it back, and I don't know why it's in Melbourne and she didn't either, but anyway. Um, <laughs> It, it, it meant that the British Empire then had the secret tea. And at that point, we had taken over, and I say we, but I'm Indian origin, but we had taken over India. Um, and that's one of the reasons why my heritage is here. Um, and uh, we started to grow tea plantations out there. And even though slavery was abolished, these tea plantations were run exactly like a slavery um, plantation. It just wasn't called slavery. Um, and that is then how we've been made tea a global um, and huge a corporation of profiteering success and even though China is one of the leading growers now in Kenya and um, India it is not the, the largest profit share and that is a, a good example of literal theft of um, botany. Now a more recent one um, is Nestle. So what Nestle have been up to is that they went to South Africa and they decided to patent Roy Bush, Red Bush tea. And that means that in a small area in South Africa where they've been growing red bush tea and have known about the benefits of red bush tea for thousands of years, and it's interesting if you were in the last conversation, there's a lot of overlap, um, that, uh, that, that was patented by Nestle and it meant that all the farmers there were in a, pro in a poverty trap. So all of the royalties after that needed to go to Nestle and none of the farmers could work to their own profit margin because their market got... Um, funneled through the Nestle brand. Now, I show this graph just to show you how concerning this patenting issue is. It, in the last decade, it's, it's shot up, and it's now a race to patent. So we're living in a world 
where Western corporations, just a few, compared to the amount of biodiversity out there, is now stealing en masse and patenting plant life from across the world. And the most diverse places that we're stealing that plant life from are places like India, Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Australia. And so we recently went to Melbourne to meet some First Nation people to understand more about how traditional knowledge has been stolen and how um, Aboriginal people have suffered. And I would really like your um, talk really run true because I think a lot of our findings are, are very similar. Um, so Nestle, in the end, they have been um, pushed to create a profit share with the local people, um, which is great, right? Although the way they've done it is that they've, they've created a shell company in South <coughs> Africa that doesn't have any profit that goes into it. So the uh, South African groups get a profit share of nothing, whereas their, their profits live in the US. Now, the biggest um, places that things are getting get patented, you can patent basically everywhere. Your product needs to be innovative, it needs to be inventive, it needs to take a new next step. Um, but if you think about Red Bull, Red Bull exists as a drink without the fizz, and the, the um, owner of Red Bull essentially carbonated that drink and has become the, um, the person who's, who's done very well over that that, which passed away recently. Uh, let me tell you what else about <coughs> So yes, yeah, some big um, patenting examples, uh, Darjeeling tea, basmati rice, turmeric, all patented by Western companies, all got to say that their rice was the best rice in the world, usually US um, firms. Yeah, if the patent is made in the US, it's pretty impossible to turn that patent over. But if it's made in other countries that have signed up to uh, the New Dealing um, Agreement, then it is possible to turn it over, but it takes a lot of time to do so. So once it goes into patent, you can't really get it out. Um, another example here is TEF. Um, TEF is a, a, a grain that's used for Ethiopian, Ethiopian and um, Eritrean, the um, uh, injera, you know, the crepe that you eat and all the foods in the middle. And you can, that has been patented by a Dutch firm and they're going to make that superfood and they're going to sell it worldwide. And that will mean that all the TEF owners have to pay them a royalty. Another really um, scary example we, that's, that's in um, kind of conflict at the moment is about bush, um, bush grass in Kenya. And there's a white um, South African guy, an individual there, who has taken the genome for that plant, and actually they found a match, so he hasn't created a new innovative step, but he says he has. If that pattern is allowed to go through, it's gone to, um, I can't remember what it's called, but world court level, you, um, world trade level, um, that will mean that if all the pasture land where the Maasai and other tribes have grazed there for thousands and thousands of years, they will have to pay them a royalty for the grass that's under their feet. It will belong to him because he's put it under a pattern. So you can imagine the complexities around that because it means that we are colonising and using our own tools, our own laws, and taking them to people, never even heard of them, and going, oh sorry, we got there first. And so when we were in um, Melbourne, we managed to meet two of the biggest biopiracy scientists, they're based at the University of New South Wales. Um, and they told us a bit more about um, these issues. And we said, what if you were in one of these countries? Could you patent everything you own? And they said, not really, because you might want to patent, say, emu oil. Is big, emu is a big issue in, in Australia, for example, because the Aboriginal people knew about all of the effects, good effects of emu. And they also responsibly took emu. They never took, killed two emus at a time, for example. They'd only take what they need. Um, but you'd have to pattern emu in a billion different ways, you know, one with oil, one with, you know, some other format. So once you release the secret of your, um, of, of what you have, then you are open to other people taking it from you. So India at the moment are creating a database, they're trying to create a database of all of the, the traditional knowledge they have, but if that, not, that database got leaked, then there's really um, uh, big issues. Now, it, it, I'm telling you kind of like a bad story, but it's important to know what the, what the good things are about patenting. Um, so smoke bush is a plant in, um, in Australia that was patented by a US pharmaceutical firm, and they are using it to treat HIV worldwide. Now the patent um, issue with that has meant that it stopped um, it them being able to use it or anyone being able to use it. And so you can imagine that some of these medicines and 
and things that could really help people everywhere uh, can, can try and come to a come to a halt. Um, so my job is to make this topic accessible, <laughs> and interesting, and make you want to engage with it exactly the way that everybody at the Pollinations Project did. Um, and my other our other job is to um, concept tour. So what we really wanted to do this time is not create huge architectural trees or big dragons. <coughs> that we have to ship around the world, but we wanted to create an idea that could uh, we could create one here um, in Bristol, at the same time we could be working with artists in Melbourne to create there, at the same time we could be working with artists in Africa to create one there, that would be very authentic and have local um, roots in each place. So yeah, it was a bit of a big ask, but with practice, I think. Um, so, what I want to do is I want to explore um, this topic with food, so with the journey of food. So what we're excited to do next is to start working with chefs um, and to uh, build a template by which we can work with a chef, we can um, look at the journey of food that has come to your plate, not, not, not about carbon footprint, about the patenting journey and how that, that might be, how you might literally be consuming not, not realising what you're consuming, and really how we are just part of the earth and the land, and we can't own plants anymore, then we can, we're going to poo them all out, so that's the point of the project. Um, <laughs> so the idea is that we, we come up with a format, and then we work with um, an artistic team in, um, I say Melbourne a lot, because we are speaking to Melbourne Festival, um, and they would have a chef there, and we would curate the menu, we'd create the experience, we'd um, hire the hospitality staff who will tell you a bit more about your food and where it's come from, and we're just working out, because obviously that's still a big, um, a big complex um, avenue to go down. So, in a couple, so we've just come back from Melbourne, we just start to <coughs> this idea, and then uh, in a couple of weeks we go to Q's Millennium Seed Bank to learn about how the seeds um, and seed ownership has has occurred and, and the and the fact that a lot of the seeds um, are now extinct or going extinct very very really fast. Um, oh yeah, and then the other thing to tell you is that we've um, been working a lot with refugee and asylum seekers in North Somerset because we're based very very close to a hotel, um, and over time we've been giving lift shares and donations and um, working to need, but. What, the first thing we want to do with this project is start cooking together and start talking about the food from our plates. Particularly, a lot of these guys, well, a few of them have said to me that they want to make injera and they don't know how because you have to ferment it and there's a process. So starting to learn about this, but, but what's occurred to me very recently is how poignant it is that refugee and asylum seekers are really here coming to our world and in inverting co comments here, I want you to know I am, that that, you know, why are they coming to our country? Our country's so great, they're trying to take all of our stuff, because this is the stuff I hear in North Somerset a lot from the local community and parish councils. And the fact is, we stole their shit. That's why they're here. You know, we, they, we stripped them from resources, we stripped them in drought, we're in lands. The reason that there's wars and conflicts is because people are on their very final days of that earth. Um, and so I think there's a, a, there's a real uh, interesting layer here to go not only are we colonising right now with our food and the, and the corporations that we work with, but we're also, this is the reason why it's, it's coming back round. Um, I don't want to make anyone like have their food and have a cry. I think it's more that um, you, people don't know about it, and I think the more oxygen that we can give to uh, knowing what, what, what's happening right now and the patenting debate, the, the, the better for me. Um, and then I just wanted to tell you a bit about our partners and the opportunities that we're, we've got at the moment. So we just spent time with the Royal Botanics in Victoria. Um, that's where we were learning about biopiracy there and the effects of on um, Aboriginal people. Uh, we are about to go to Q Malone Seed Bank. We're working with National Trust nationally because they're, um, we, we just told them about this idea recently um, and they're really excited because they're growing gastro gardens all over the trust and they need to also look and acknowledge their collections and um, and I think it needs to be future facing as well as past facing um, and we're part of the British Council Australian um, season and we're working with an artist in um, Glasgow as well and then just thank you to our funders um, 
And that's me. And I think there's a Q&A thing now. So not really, it's really, really, really hard. But but yes, they are usually part of the fight. And once you know about stuff like this, you start reading, like I was reading an article about um, um, malaria, a herb about malaria. And this article was written by a good charity. It wasn't Woodland Trust, but it was something like that. And it was like, um, Mexico jealously guarded this plant that could have helped malaria and they didn't want to give it away until they've got this agreement and blah blah and you're like, it's just all very, once you see it, you see how we vilify that quite a lot. I, I kind of understand it when uh, working with kind of single ingredients like a pattern. How, how does it work with something, I can't remember the name of the Ethiopian um, Injure, yeah. Injure, how does that? How does it work where some where something is likely to have kind of variation or like or ch or changes depending on where it's made or do you know what I mean? But how do you kind of prove that that's the the original? Yeah, I think a lot of the issue is because we've got so many plants, so much biodiversity. A lot of corporations say that they have created the new genome or say that they've created a variation, and even if they find the original, they they ha they just put it in with another component and patent that one. So you'll see, if you look at EMU, I say EMU because the scientists we're working with are fighting against a lot of the patents against EMU. It's like 150 out. They're all essentially the same thing, just slightly different. <coughs> so yeah, that's good. I knew about the tech thing, but I thought the Ethiopian government were fighting They are, yeah. 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 Right. 